2020 event is the most significant international event uh, since independence. That's what you had said. Why do you think it is the biggest and the most uh, special and fantastic event that India is hosting since independence? Well, you know, um, in the past, I'm saying in the distant past, it's 1983, even before I joined service in 1984, uh, and that is already distant, uh, we had two major international conferences. One was the Non-Aligned Movement Summit, and the other was the Commonwealth Heads of Government uh, Summit. Both these uh, were big meetings, had number of heads of state and government, but I think the difference between them and the G20 presidency that we're taking on now is that those were one-off events. I mean, those events were one major meeting in Delhi of these heads of state and government, whereas the G20 has consisted of 200 odd meetings that we've hosted across our country, culminating in a summit in Delhi. And uh, of course, the second difference is that uh, the G20 will bring together the most important countries of the world, the developed economies and the largest emerging economies. So in a certain sense, the galaxy of leaders that we will host in New Delhi in two weeks from now will be unprecedented as far as our history is concerned. Yes, and uh, when India took over the presidency, uh, you know, it happened in the backdrop of two black swan events. COVID-19 pandemic and also uh, an ongoing conflict in Russia, Ukraine. In terms of challenges and opportunities, you had spoken about it when uh, we took charge and now 10 months into it, are you one of those who will say that you, all the expectations that you had, India has been able to meet those? Well, uh, our presidency has come at a difficult time internationally. I think there's no doubt about it. Um, the impact of both these black swan events, as you mentioned, have been felt across the world in lowering rates of growth, high inflation. But it's the developing world, you know, the global south that has faced the brunt of that, uh, of these crises, whether it is through uh, the increasing costs of uh, essential imports of food, fuel and fertilizers, whether it's through lowering demand for their services and goods, um, it has led to a level of indebtedness that we have not ever seen. There are 70 low-income countries in the world today who are either indebted or at the risk of indebtedness. And that's really unprecedented. So given those circumstances and given the fact that there is a huge expectation from the international community that the G20 will take up the mandate to provide macroeconomic and financial stability in the world, I think our presidency is very important. And we have to keep in mind uh, the fact that the organizations, the international organizations that really should be um, uh, dealing with these uh, crisis situations, whether it's the United Nations or other international organizations, have today not been able to perform up to expectations. You know, the lack of representation uh, in these organizations has led to a lack of trust and effectiveness. So uh, in those circumstances, it is the G smaller groupings like the G20 that have come to the fore that have the representational nature, nature they have also uh, the necessary, I would say, wherewithal in implementation terms because you have all the organizations, the UN, the IMF, World Bank, OECD, regional organizations like the African Union and the ASEAN as part of the G20 meeting. So when the G20 takes a decision, its implementation is across the board, is very effective. So our presidency comes at that moment, and I think, uh, you know, for many countries, India's presidency is, uh, for them, a ray of hope. And we have engaged the Global South, we've had a dialogue. But from their perspective, uh, this is an opportunity for them to, um, for the G20 to provide some sort of guidance, some sort of solutions to global challenges. Yes, since you've spoken about the Global South, I'm going to take that in a bit. But before that, when Prime Minister Narendra Modi officially took you know, India took over the presidency in uh, December 2022 in Bali. He had said that India will ensure that G20 in India would be decisive, action-oriented, and ambitious. How much of that has been achieved, particularly in the sense of inclusivity? Yes, I think, uh, you know, the vision of the Prime Minister was to take the G20 presidency to a level where we meet the expectations, not just of our partners in the G20, 
but the entire international community, especially, as you said, the Global South. And if you see our broad priorities, you know, how to stimulate growth, how to uh, provide momentum to the faltering SDG process, how to use uh, digital public infrastructure uh, to um, empower people, how to strengthen multilateral institutions, and uh, how to foster women-led development. These have been our broad priorities, and these are the priorities of the Global South. And I think uh, even before we reach the summit, if you look at many of the uh, 200 meetings that have happened, and especially the ministerials that have resulted in outcome documents and, uh, and uh, consensus uh, formulations from within the G20, you can see that much of what we set out to achieve has, uh, has received a lot of support and traction from the G20 uh, members. So uh, take the SDGs. You know, for example, we have a seven-year plan to stimulate the SDG, SDG process up to 2030, uh, and that has been endorsed by the group. We have uh, a broad, you know, the high principles of uh, digital public infrastructure. Everybody agrees that we can use the G20's experience and expertise, and especially that of India, uh, in terms of digital public infrastructure to take it to countries across the world, especially developing countries, and to, to help them empower their own citizens, ensure that delivery of uh, developmental and other benefits reaches the grassroots levels, as we have done in our own country. Uh, you take the multilateral development banks, for example. You know, there's a sense that the IMF, the World Bank, haven't performed up to expectations in the 21st century. The demands on them in terms of alleviating indebtedness, in terms of providing climate finance, have not been fully met. How can we strengthen their mandate? How can we ensure that there is adequate resource availability for these multilateral institutions to enable them to perform uh, up to expectation? And there, I think, again, we have made some very good progress and success. So there is, uh, you know, whichever sector you take it, wherever the developing world has a certain expectations, I think our presidency has worked to meet those expectations. And, and of course, as we uh, come closer to the summit, and during the summit, I think you will see a lot more of what we have been able to achieve with our G20 partners in providing or meeting or providing solutions to the global challenges of the day. India is currently the chair of SCO, also G20. We were there at the high table also at uh, G7 in Hiroshima. India is part of Quad. So has India managed to send that message that, you know, when you use that phrase, ray of hope, it is about those aspirational nations who are revisiting the global order which was there post-World War II, which has to be, you know, perhaps restructured in the post-COVID world. Well, uh, as I said, we are today in, in a very divided and polarized uh, geopolitical order. Um, and we are, uh, as, as a country, I think, in a very fortunate position. And as you mentioned, we straddle that ideological space between North and South and East and West. Uh, and we are in a position to deal with, uh, with our partner countries across the world on issues that are important. And, and I think uh, if you look at our endeavor, it is always to work towards the larger global common good or human-centric globalization, as the Prime Minister calls it. And in that endeavor, I think it is important that we, um, you know, our, our theme for the G20, one earth, one family, one future, I think uh, really exemplifies our approach towards uh, dealing with the international community, that we need to work together if we are to move successfully to the future. Mankind and, and the world is to move towards the future. And from that perspective, I think unity is important. Getting countries together is important. And of course, global governance, and that was your question, global governance in terms of getting international organizations that today reflect the requirements of the 21st century, include developing countries, include the African Union, for example. Africa is a co continent of 54 countries, is not represented in the UN Security Council, which is why India has asked for the African Union to be included as a permanent member of the G20. So all of these efforts, we hope, will result in a more equitable world order, a more representational uh, global governance structure, and one that will enable the international community to face the challenges of tomorrow. I think that's very important. BRICS ka abhi vistar hua, 5 se 11 desh, total number bada hai. Bharat ne bar bar is baat par 
दबाव डाला है कि यू का रिप्रजेंटेशन बढ़ना चाहिए क्या ये सब उसी डरेक्शन में जा रहा है और क्या आपको लगता है यू भी रिविजिट करेगा अपना जो उनका जो फंक्शन है और जो रोल है एज अ बॉडी ताकि जो रिप्रेजेंटेशन की आप बात कर रहे हैं इक्विटेबल ऑर्डर की बात कर रहा है भारत वो सब दिखे उसमें तो हमारा जो पोजीशन है कि यूएन सिक्योरिटी काउंसिल में रिप्रेजेंटेशन बढ़ना चाहिए खास तौर से जो विकासशील देश हैं उनका रिप्रेजेंटेशन सिक्योरिटी काउंसिल और अन्य यू और इंटरनेशनल संगठनों में आना चाहिए वो हम पहले से ही कहते रहे हैं और ब्रिक्स में भी यही चर्चा हुई है अगर आप देखें तो जी ट्वेंटी में या ब्रिक्स में या एस में जितने भी इंटरनेशनल ऑर्गेनाइजेशन में हम संसद हैं वहाँ पे हमने ज़रूर ये पॉइंट का जिक्र किया है कि वर्ल्ड ऑर्डर जो है रिप्रेजेंटेशन होना चाहिए और ऐसे देश शामिल होना चाहिए इन संगठनों में जिससे प्रभाव पड़े जिससे फ़र्क हो और जिससे वर्ल्ड गवर्नेंस जो है बेहतर रहे और ब्रिक्स में भी मेरे ख्याल से काफ़ी मतलब हमारे जो पार्टनर्स हैं वो सहमत हैं कि यू एन सिक्योरिटी काउंसिल बढ़ना चाहिए ज़रूर नुआंसेज में कुछ अंतर होंगे कुछ विवाद होंगे पर जहाँ खास तौर से आई मीन जनरली आप अगर देखें तो इसके लिए ज़रूर सपोर्ट है अंतर्राष्ट्रीय कम्युनिटी से ग्लोबल साउथ की चर्चा करते हैं अभी हम अंतर्राष्ट्रीय स्तर पर भारत ग्लोबल साउथ की आवाज़ बनते जा रहा है आ, जब ये ग्लोबल साउथ फ्रेज बना तो किस 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 कंट्रीज़ को ध्यान में रख कर के बनाया गया था और 125 कंट्रीज़ जो बताया जा रहा है उसके हिस्सा हैं तो आपको क्या लगता है कि ये सबका साथ सबका विकास जो हिंदुस्तान का मॉडल है वही अब अंतर्राष्ट्रीय स्तर पर है नहीं बिल्कुल जब हम ग्लोबल साउथ कहते हैं तो जितने भी विकासशील देश हैं और आपने 125 देशों के बात किया तो ये ग्लोबल साउथ के प्रतिनिधि हैं और इनके साथ हमारी एक बड़ा अच्छा संपर्क हुआ जब हमने वॉइस ऑफ ग्लोबल साउथ समिट ऑर्गेनाइज किया था और ये हमारी जी ट्वेंटी अध्यक्षता से पहले हमने किया ताकि इनको हम कंसल्ट करें इनके विचार हम आ, हम कंसिडर करें और इनके जो एक्सपेक्टेशंस हैं हमारी प्रेजिडेंसी की वो भी हम मतलब फैक्टर इन करें जब हम हमारे ब्रॉड प्रायोरिटीज़ और हमारे जी ट्वेंटी पार्टनर्स के साथ हम एंगेज करेंगे तो आ, और ये टर्म ग्लोबल साउथ ब्रॉडली डेवलपिंग कंट्रीज़ को ही मतलब डिनोट करते हैं और इसमें हमने देखा है कि ग्लोबल साउथ में काफ़ी मतलब कंसर्नस हैं कि आज यूक्रेन कॉन्फ्लिक्ट चल रही है आज इंटरनेशनल कम्युनिटी जो मेन कंट्रीज़ हैं उनका काफ़ी प्रियोकुपेशन किसी और मतलब डायरेक्शन पे है और इनके जो कंसर्नस हैं जैसे फूड सिक्योरिटी कंसर्नस हैं एनर्जी सिक्योरिटी कंसर्नस हैं इन्फ्लेशन के कंसर्नस हैं तो इसके बारे में आ, कोई मतलब ये इनका महसूस हो रहा है कि ये एरियाज़ में थोड़ा सा निगलेक्ट हुआ है तो इसमें वो वो काफ़ी मतलब भारत पे भारत के ओर देखते हैं कि जब भारत ने अध्यक्षता ली है जी ट्वेंटी के तो जी ट्वेंटी एक बॉडी होना चाहिए जिस पे ये जो डिसीशंस हैं कि हम कैसे डील करेंगे ये मुद्दों से ये डिसीशंस लिया जाए निर्णय लिया जाए आउटकम ये समिट के टाइम पे तो आपने पॉइंट्स ऑफ कन्वर्जेंसेस की बात की जैसे फूड सिक्योरिटी एनर्जी सिक्योरिटी क्या ये मुद्दे जो भारत सोचता है बाकी देशों के उनके इंटरेस्ट्स में है वर दे देंटर स्टेज वर यू एबल टू पुट स्पॉट लाइट ऑन दैम सो आई थिंक ऑल ऑफ आर डिस्कशन इन द जी ट्वेंटी सो फार हैव बीन एग्जैक्टली ऑन दीज इशूज यू नो वेन यू टॉक अबाउट एनर्जी सिक्योरिटी दर इज एनर्जी वर्किंग ग्रुप दैट हैज लुकड इन टू दैट वेन यू टॉक अबाउट फूड सिक्योरिटी देन दर इज एन एग्रीकल्चरल वर्किंग ग्रुप इनफैक्ट अगर आप देखें तो हमारे जो महारिषि इनिशियटिव्स हैं मिलेट्स एंड अदर एंशियट ग्रीन्स तो आज जब क्लाइमेट चेंज की समस्या हो रही है वेन देर इज़ अ इंटायर इशू ऑफ क्लाइमेट चेंज पीपल आर लुकिंग फॉर अ सुपर फूड बट वी हैव हैड द सुपर फूड फॉर सेंचुरीज यू नो वी हैव बीन कंज्यूमिंग मिलेट्स अदर कंट्रीज बीन कंज्यूमिंग मिलेट्स मिलेट्स इज अ क्लाइमेट रेजिस्टेंट क्रॉप इट डजेंट नीड फर्टिलाइजर और पेस्टिसाइड्स इट इज़ हाईली न्यूट्रिशियस एंड टूडे दिस इज अ क्रॉप दैट वी आर इंट्रोड्यूसिंग टू द वर्ल्ड ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी थ्री इज द इंटरनेशनल ईयर ऑफ द मिलेट्स 
And uh, we have said that the Maharishi, um, you know, campaign, which I think the G20 has endorsed, should be worldwide. We should be looking at solutions to climate change in ways that are unique, ways that go beyond the normal climate action-oriented uh, measures. And I think we have been quite successful. Take lifestyle for environment. You know, the Prime Minister's vision that it should not just be climate actions. It should also be a people-oriented movement. What we are saying is that you know, the world is living far beyond its sustainable levels. The UN Secretary General, when he came to India, said we are living at 1.6 times the level in which we can sustain, uh, you know, a, a sort of life normally on Earth. And in that context, we have said that there should be sustainable consumption. So lifestyle for environment means every person on this planet, and we have talked about pro-planet people, should be involved in an effort to conserve, to the extent possible, resources, scarce resources of the Earth. So whether it's waste to wealth, whether it's the circular economy, these are all parts of the larger concept of a lifestyle for environment. Again, when you talk about lifestyle for sustainable development, this is what the G20 is also very happy to. And, and there were several department-specific events, education ministers, agriculture minister, energy security events that were organized. And uh, so let's come to the scalability of this entire event that was held for 10 months and it'll continue and of course it'll be culminating in two weeks from now. 56 cities uh, and uh, from Kashmir to Kanyakumari, many cities you would have traveled for the first time perhaps, Mr. Shingla. Uh, would you say that India has been an outstanding host, Vasudev Kutumkam, and you would have sent that message to other countries as well? And what makes India, you know, it, it was like the tourism experience, traveling to each and every part of India the world saw India differently? And how has this been different from how other countries have had their G20 year? So when we take on a presidency like the G20, and this is the first time we've been president of the G20, so it's an opportunity for us. How do we use this opportunity? First and foremost, I think we try to place our narrative on the global agenda. You know, as a diplomat for a number of decades, all I've done is respond to the initiatives taken by others. Today, we are taking initiatives, whether it's the International Day of Yoga, International Day of Billets, whether you talk about any uh, initiative in the world, a lot of those initiatives come from India. Uh, so if you talk about Vasudeva Kutumbakam, which also I think is, is uh, a concept that increasingly is getting traction, is basically working for the global common good, working for the interests of humanity. And from that point of view, um, we are also looking, you know, in terms of what we can do, uh, Atiti Devo Bhava, Welcome your guests, show them your cultural heritage, your cultural diversity, your tourism potential. And if you look at the vision of the Prime Minister, he, you know, in the beginning we said let's do it in 13 cities because that is as far as our mind could stretch. But he said no, let us do it in every state and union territory of India. And today I think we will have completed 200 meetings in about 60 cities. I mean by the time we finish our presidency we would have completed that record. 60 cities of India have hosted G20 meetings. I think no other country in the G20 has even come close to that record. And what we have done really is taken the G20 to every corner of our country. Every small city and town of our country has welcomed the G20. And as such, we have democratized the G20. Through a Jan Bhagidari mode, we have taken the G20 to the grassroots levels. So every citizen of India today has been a stakeholder and a partner in our G20 process. It is not a remote exercise in the capital New Delhi. It has involved people across our country, and people have come forward in every way, whether it's the Youth 20, whether it is Women's 20, whether it is uh, Think 20, it's Civil 20. Uh, lakhs and lakhs of our people have come together to support the G20 process. So I think this has made, you know, the democratization of the G20 has made it, uh, as has been said earlier, people's G20 has popularized it. And today I think it is, if you look at our logo, Initially, we tried to say that, uh, you know, you can use the logo and we were very selective, but everybody now uses the logo, right from shopping malls to auto rickshaw drivers. It's ubiquitous, it's all over the country. There are multinational companies coming to us and says, saying, can we use your logo? And you talked about Srinagar. I was there when an international media person asked me, he says, how much are you paying these companies to use your logo? So we said, it's the other way around. Companies should be paying us to use our logo. It is that popular. But yes, we have taken it to... Srinagar, we have taken it to uh, Itanagar, we have taken it to, uh, you know, Lakshadweep, Diu, 
and we have taken the G20 to places. And which are the cities that you traveled because you have been a career diplomat uh, where you had not been in the past. And in terms of local economy, the transformation that it saw, the push that it received, besides beautification and the infrastructure push that we saw all over the country. So everywhere you've taken the G20 to, I think uh, there has been a very, very interesting phenomenon. You know, states have come forward, municipalities have come forward, local organizations have come forward and, let, and have said, let's present our best face. And as a result, wherever we've taken the G20, we've found a lot of investments in urban infrastructure and urban transformations. If you go to Jodhpur, they've made huge changes in the city. They've, you know, um, widened pavements, uh, made roads better, built uh, better structures. I'm just giving an example. If you go to uh, Bangalore, you will see the same thing. You go to smaller cities and towns all over the country, including my part of the country, which is Darjeeling and Siliguri. You've seen changes that the states have brought about. You've been seen changes that the municipality has brought about. And these changes will go beyond the G20. So if we can take the G20 to places, and it has a lasting impact on cities and towns across India, especially the smaller ones. You know, cities are competing to be the cleanest city, the best city, the most, uh, I would say, uh, you know, efficient city and so on and so forth. Srinagar, for example, the smart cities program coincided with the G20 and that city was transformed. People are absolutely amazed at what Srinagar looks like. That walk along the Jhelum, the Dal Lake, etc. has been completely, uh, you know, changed and improved. And I think as a result, there was a lot of local support, a lot of local traction saying that why don't you get more events like the G20. The other thing is that uh, many of these cities have never hosted an international event, ever. So you host an international event like the G20, you have about 200 delegates that come from all over the world, a couple of hundred media people. These cities are encouraged because they've expanded capacity, they have confident, they can now host not only international conferences, they can host commercial conferences, they can host MICE events. And I think this is the difference uh, that it has made, which will, I think the resonance of this will go far beyond our G20 presence. And uh, we have Youth 20 and Women 20 also in the audience who will be asking some questions to you. Let's, so let's open the floor for some questions now. Will the mic be moved, please? Yes, please. Go ahead. Uh, as India have the G20 presidency for the first time, so in the same regard, what is the current status of India as a G20 leader and what are the future possibilities to continue this leadership? Basically, how do you continue with the momentum? Yes, so G20 is, I think, a unique opportunity and we undoubtedly will have many more opportunities. You see, if you look at the month of December 2022, India was in the position where we were president of three international bodies. We were president of the UN Security Council, we were president of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which you mentioned, and we were also president of G20. And in a certain sense, you've got the feeling that we have come on to the global high table. And I'm sure that uh, given our leadership, that we have exemplified through our own examples and our own best practices. There will be many other opportunities uh, to lead uh, by, through example and to lead, especially uh, the, those countries that want to see change for the better, for more development. Uh, more questions? Yes, please. Hello, sir. My name is Ishika Sharma. So, sir, my question is, may you please enlighten us that how India is becoming a voice for smaller nations through its G20 presidency. Okay, let's combine that with another question. Yes, please. Go ahead. Pass on the mic. Hello, sir. My name is Surbit Gehlot and I'm from Bennett University. My question to you is, uh, as, we, uh, as uh, one of the agenda of India is uh, the multilateral institutions for the 21st century. So what do you mean by that? And uh, why do you think that we need all these organizations? So, um, I mean, I think the two questions are uh, interlinked in a sense that, you know, multilateral institutions uh, have an important impact uh, on the developing world because they have the ability to really make a difference. But today we are saying that these multilateral institutions that have been created in the, in the aftermath of the Second World War, whether it's the United Nations or the Bretton Woods institutions, haven't really come up to the expectations 
of the world, especially the developing world. And what can we do to change that? And that is where the first question is relevant, is that India is perceived to be the voice of the global south. And we need to factor in, I mean, we ourselves are a developing country, but we have shown through example. I mean, if you take the Jandan Aadhaar, we have shown that we can have a billion Aadhaar cards, we can provide bank accounts to 480 million people, we can have the cheapest internet telephony rates in the world, and thereby empower our people through direct benefits transfers. Uh, we can, what can we do to help those 3 billion people who don't have identity cards in the world, a billion people who don't have bank accounts in the world, how can we help them? And so while, you know, the voice of the Global South is articulation, we take it to the UN, we take it to the G20, we take it to BRICS. If you saw the PM's message in the BRICS, it was human-centric globalization. That is where we represent the interests of the developing world, which I think today is appreciated across the board. But we also demonstrate it through example. You know, India has called for the African Union to be a permanent invitee to the uh, G20. And we have done that because we believe that Africa and countries in the global south should have better representation, whether it's the G20, it's the Security Council, it's any organization that is international and involves international governance, so that you are more effective when you are better represented. Um, and of course, uh, we also want to make that difference through uh, example. In other words, how can we help Africa? We have so many schemes, uh, you know, e Arogya, e Vidya Bharati, e many schemes that help uh, Africa, many projects, including lines of credit that uh, develop infrastructure, that develop those countries as per their priorities. I mean, we are one country that has never said, we will give you this, this is what you need, and these are the conditions under which we will give you this. We have always said that, what do you want, and how can we help you? And that has been our approach. And so, it is not a recent approach, it is an approach that has always existed, but what we have done in recent years is to make it more effective, we have certainly uh, made our foreign policy oriented towards working for the global common good, uh, whether it's in COVID, where we gave medicines to over 190 countries, whether through vaccine Maitri, we shared our limited vaccines with countries across the world. Uh, we have demonstrated that we have the potential and the willingness to help countries, uh, the developing countries across the world. So we are not just a voice, we are more than a voice, we are also a practical example of what developing countries can do and do to help themselves and, of course, articulate it through bodies and organizations in which we have a leadership position. Let's take some more questions. Yes, please, ma'am. Go ahead. Yeah. Hello. Uh, please elaborate a little more about how Kashmiri people have taken this because the young generation, this is the first time they are seeing something like this happening in their city. So, uh, little, uh, sure. some anecdotes also if you have to share. So that's a very interesting question because I went at least two or three times, you know, to prepare uh, for that G20 meeting in Srinagar. And uh, what we definitely uh, wanted was that uh, there is a certain amount of uh, uh, not just, uh, you know, organization in the meeting that we will host, but also support of the administration, the union territory in organizing the meeting. And as I said, I think it was very coincidental that we had, uh, you know, we, we accelerated the existing uh, urban transformation programs, including the Smart Cities program. Um, when I went six months earlier, there was a lot to be done. But when we went for the sum, uh, actual meeting there, what I found was that there was a world of difference. You know, the city had been completely transformed. Uh, and I think beautified, improved, uh, but improved in ways that are long-lasting, not just cosmetic improvements. Uh, the people, my sense was because I tried to move around as much as possible in Srinagar uh, myself. I went on the Jhelum uh, walk, I went on the Dal, we went to various parts of uh, Srinagar. And I also talked to people across the board. And what I found was that people said, look, we've never had this sort of international event. Uh, that you could bring 200 foreign delegates and have a tourism meeting, that means the top world tourism uh, officials come down to Srinagar, come down to Jammu and Kashmir. People could never imagine that's possible. And it was conducted in an atmosphere of complete peace and tranquility. There was not a single demonstration, not a single incident in that point, period of time. And I'll tell you why that was. Because people believed that this was in their own interest. People were supportive of that G20 process. And the one thing we heard from a lot of people was, please do more of these international events. We need this sort of attention. We need this sort of support. 
And I think if you look at the Shere Kashmir Convention Center, it's a very nice one, completely up upgraded for the G20. They can host international meetings of a similar nature. I mean, they have the confidence now, they have the ability to do it. And I'm sure you'll see much more. As the train reaches Srinagar, as the highway, uh, you know, the highway connecting Jammu and Srinagar becomes operational by this year, uh, we already had uh, about two crore tourists uh, that were expected this year. And many more have come. I think the left-hand government made a statement that because of G20, many more tourists have come. The number of foreign tourists have increased enormously. And I was asked very often there by the media, they said, you know, the, uh, many of the embassies have put out advisories that you should not visit Srinagar. And my point was that if you see around us, you're seeing representatives of all these countries. The top officials of all these countries are here. We've had, we also have a lot of foreign tourists coming in. And none of them have experienced any issue because everybody in Jammu and Kashmir believes that tourism is in their own interest. There is a percolation of wealth down to the grassroots level. The chap making, you know, uh, a, a piece of uh, handicrafts uh, which is, which is uh, bought by tourists is benefiting. Uh, the person at the absolute bottom rung of that socioeconomic ladder is also benefiting. So there is benefit across the board. And I think this is, the, this is what G20 has done. Srinagar is a very, very good example, but across the board, whether it's the northeast, whether it is, uh, you know, in the south, west, you have actually stimulated, uh, you know, your own handicrafts, your own uh, craftspeople, your own cultural people, your, your own cuisines, and popularized them across the world and given confidence to our citizens across the country. And I think this is really what matters. But Srinagar for me is always... Uh, Somehow, I feel very attached to that one meeting because we have spent so much effort in making that meeting a success. And the fact that our delegates have gone back and said that this is the best meeting we have had, this is the best exposure we have had, I think gave us a lot of satisfaction. Okay, so we have really come to the end of this discussion. Ma'am, you want to have a, a quick question, please, 30 seconds. Uh, I'm Dr. Nidhi Jha, I'm a gynecologist. Uh, I just want to ask, what do we have for healthcare sector uh, being uh, president of G20? So, healthcare, uh, you know, there is a lot of global interest because after COVID, everybody wants to work together to promote uh, global cooperation in healthcare. One of the most important things is that how do we respond to emergencies in the future? You know, if you have another pandemic of that nature that we just experienced, how does the global community come together? So, there is a decision to establish a mechanism whereby countries can cooperate more effectively. Um, you know, there is, of course, uh, you know, digital, digital health. We have led by example, I mean, Arogya Setu or CoWin platform for which we administered, through which we administered over two crore uh, vaccines uh, uh, to our people. All of these examples are those that we can use uh, and we have used in the health sector in the G20. So I think that is an area of success and where I think everybody was keen to cooperate and get the results. So my last question, uh, G20 finance ministers meet failed to agree on a joint statement. How optimistic or positive are you for when the heads of state meet? I would put it somewhere, somewhat differently. I think they succeeded in getting an outcome that everybody agreed to. Every paragraph in that statement had been approved by consensus by all delegates in that, in that uh, meeting, except one which pertained to a geopolitical issue over which I think there is still as I said, in between nations that are there, that will take some time to resolve. But otherwise, everybody believes that the reason that we are there in the G20 is larger than just our country's interest. It is a global interest. And if we don't succeed, if the G20 doesn't succeed, we don't succeed. There's a very clear sense. So I think everybody wants to collaborate. Everybody wants to work together to make the G20 a success not for themselves, but for the entire world, in keeping with Vasudeva. Thank you so much for your time, sir.